So again, my name is Marta. I'll be your host today. We're going to embark on this journey together through our experience as Cyclone providers. Firstly, please welcome all of you to this session. Um, as I understand it, this will also be recorded um, so and made available to everyone uh, to be watched at any other time. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, we will begin by introducing our technology and then move on to some performance considerations and go over some relevant case studies at the very end of the presentation. And finally, we'll save a little time for a Q&A session. For this, I would ask you to write your questions in the chat. So Advanced Cyclone Systems is a company exclusively dedicated to the development of optimized cyclones. And this means that we only actually do cyclones. We are experts in gas solid separation and the company's goal is to harness that expertise and help our clients maximize their collection efficiency, comply with emission limits at lower capex and opex, solve operational problems or improve sustainability issues. Uh, we were uh, established back in 2008. We're headquartered here in Portugal. We have some people in Brazil and pretty much all over the world in terms of agency or representation. We have become a worldwide reference in cyclones with over 400 installations in 37 countries over the past 15 years. For a lot of applications, ACS can replace other separation technologies like bag houses or even ESPs. In the pharmaceutical applications, more often than not, we just replace current cyclones or come in with a secondary high efficiency cyclone to improve performance. The way that we position ourselves on the market is mainly divided in two categories. Clients will either need to comply with emission limits, which are mandatory in many countries, or they aim to recover valuable powders. More and more, uh, we're seeing people requiring both. In the pharmaceutical industry, of course, we're there on the right. Uh, on the emission side, we have biomass and coal combustion boilers, some biomass driver, dryers like panel board companies, calcination and mineral processing, oil and gas furnaces, fuel oil, and a lot of high temperature separation processes like gasification or pyrolysis. On the product recovery side, which is where we are today, we have any company that wishes to improve their efficiency by recovering more powder. Um, and then we have, of course, nanoparticles, chemicals, food ingredients, and what we're here for, uh, APIs. AC work, ACS works a lot of times like a barometer for the economy in so much as a few years ago, we were seeing an increased demand for lactose, lactose-free situations where people were using bag houses but now don't because of cross-contamination. And then we started seeing some vegetable proteins, for instance, lithium processing. And these days it's all about carbon capture. This is our global presence today. So all the countries where we have supplied systems for. Uh, for pharmaceutical, actually, uh, we've done Cape Verde in Africa to start there. A lot of them here in Europe, France and Germany, and of course, the United States, Lonza, Merck, Teva, and other companies. And we've also supplied a few of them for India and Israel. So delving into the technological part, uh, we're going to be talking about the advantages of cyclones. These are, of course, well known. They are very robust. There's little to no maintenance required, no pressure problems, no moving parts. They work on a dry basis. There's no temperature restrictions. Uh, in fact, we've done quite a few for very high temperatures and conversely for very low temperatures. And there's no electrostatic components or usually there isn't. There are no physical filters, so this is a, there is a vast industrial application field for this sort of equipment. The offset is that they have been notoriously low efficient for very small particles, and we're talking here about less than 10 micron or even less than that. So typically, traditional non-optimized cyclones need to be complemented with other separators due to their low efficiency. And so the solution is to develop more efficient cyclones. And the way that we go about it is to further understand and optimize cyclonic separation. And so how do we go about improving cyclone efficiency? Separation dynamics inside of a cyclone have always been notoriously hard to model. 
In the late 70s and early 80s, our CTO, Professor Romualdo Salcedo, decided to apply his knowledge of optimization to cyclonic separation, publishing our own expansion of an existing theoretical model that takes into account the agglomeration that occurs inside of a cyclone. This agglomeration is a well-known phenomenon and it is more of a clustering effect in that we are not changing the product characteristics. To harness the potential of agglomeration, we have built a software that can calculate particle trajectory. We are able to generate some virtual prototypes and run simulations where we feed each cyclone some 300,000 particles, and then we can analyze which ones were caught and which ones escaped. And, and by this, we use the theoretical model uh, of uh, dynamics with turbulent fields inside cyclones. In the end, we come up with the best model for the client, understanding that the goal might not be efficiency alone, though today it's all about performance. But there might be height constraints or other space budget constraints, pressure drop or overall cost of the project. We can also further improve collection efficiency by adding mechanical recirculation of part or whole of the flow and using a power source on top of it if required. However, this is more directed to some niche applications such as nanoparticles, and we will not be going deeper into these solutions in this webinar, but do feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to know more about this. And so our competitive advantage is sustained by unique ability to accurately estimate and consequently guarantee a requested efficiency, resulting in better cyclones tuned for your specific application. We, I had just talked about harnessing the potential of agglomeration, and what we're talking about is the effect of larger particles colliding with smaller particles, and in particular, when these collisions are productive. And by that, I mean that a large particle manages to drag along a smaller particle, thus improving the efficiency on this smaller range of the particle size. And so it follows that the more collisions we have inside of a cyclone, the better and also that these collisions do actually result in the larger particles dragging along the smaller particles. What further impacts cyclone efficiency? Well, uh, the longer a particle stays inside of a cyclone, the better chances you have at catching it. And this is what we mean when we say extending residence time to improve efficiency. How do we do this? How do we improve residence time? Well, we need volume. So we need larger, longer cyclones for the same flow. Also, um, the larger the particle is that manages to successfully collide with the smaller particle, the better. And so uh, this really means in practical terms is that a wide particle size distribution gets us better results. Uh, and in the end, inlet concentration. It's uh, well known that concentration positively affects performance. The higher the loading into a cyclone, the higher the collection efficiency will be. Conversely, please uh, notice that emissions will also rise because we can see here, for instance, that the emissions on this end are lower than the emissions on this end, though this is 20% and this is 95%, but in absolute terms, 95% of 7 milligrams is a whole lot less than 20% of 70 grams. And in, in the end, I just want to draw a conclusion here that we're just talking about how uh, performance varies with these um, parameters, knowing that a lot of the times our clients will actually not be able to change them around because you do have your own process, your own recipe for spray drying, and so we just need to work around it. For a quick explanation of how our software works, we fit all the operating conditions into the model, so fluid velocity, temperature, the particle size distribution, and then we load these 300,000, 500,000 particles uh, into um, a whole lot of prototypes, some 17,000, and we calculate the trajectory of those particles. And the first thing we're going to check is, have there been collisions? And if there haven't been collisions, then we increase residence time, so the larger, longer cyclones. And if there have been collisions, then we're going to ask, but have they been productive? So are the larger particles dragging along the smaller particles? And if they are, we're happy, we have a new so solution that fits our clients' needs. And if they're not, we're going to need to increase speed. Uh, this is just, uh, well, uh, our uh, theoretical and experimental results. This is one of our first ever charts. 
We do continuous R&D, of course, R&D is the very basis of our company. Uh, we actually have a, a lab uh, pilot here in Porto where I'm uh, speaking from, and then we have an industrial um, pilot a little up north. So these are just the conclusions of what I was saying uh, in this last section of the, um, of the presentation. Just give me a moment. In that, as I was saying, firstly, we have extended an existing theoretical model to predict fine particle clustering or agglomeration in turbo cyclone flows. There's good agreement between what have experimentally observed and calculated in our model. And so this is now the theoretical framework on which to base our hypothesis and uh, that clustering inside of a cyclone is responsible for the very high collection on the finer side of the PSD. And so uh, now for the cyclones themselves. We play around with eight dimensions to get the model that we need for the client over the years by testing out different models and running tests on our lab and industrial pilot. We have come up with some cyclone families that we can tweak to meet client requirements. At this point, we divide our families into three main groups. You can see there on the left some compact models. These can do away with a lot of powder at low pressure drop and low occupied volume. In the middle, we have our high efficiency cyclones, excellent process cyclones, and they can also be used as an end stage filter depending on the product. And then on the right, we have our high end agglomerator cyclones, and these tend to be further used for very strict emission limits or very high value powders which I imagine is the case for most of you watching there. And in fact, for the pharmaceutical industry, though we have very often sold uh, HR uh, cyclones, the MKs are usually the ones that our clients go for uh, since they are, uh, well, they seem to be there on the picture, our highest efficiency model. Uh, but this year we have actually put in something new. We have the new KX. It's still not on our marketing uh, material but um, two of your, they're not here today because I have already done a presentation for some, um, some pharmaceutical companies that's very similar to this one, um, but uh, Mankind Corporation and uh, another uh, company already have purchased um, KX. Hovion also has one. Um, now we're just going to see, you know, for one particular case, this is actually <laughs> for fly ash, um, how efficiency might change for these families of cyclones. Um, and, and you can see there, uh, very interesting that, uh, so we, I always start my comparison here on the HR, which is our mid range model. And so for a sense of how this works, our HR usually cuts back emissions from other high efficiency cyclones on the market. So we're talking about Gaia or SPX, uh, by 50%. And then RRE will cut back those emissions by 50% and then the MK of further 50%. How do you pay for this? With volume. Uh, we have been uh, talking about this. We need to circle back to that residence time and occupying volume. Uh, and you can see there that if we were to take cyclones uh, that would all be one meter in diameter, how many we would need for the different families. Of course, in practicality, we would do this like this, we'll just increase the diameter. But I had talked about cutting emissions by half from the HR to the RE, and then you can see that it's more than twice the volume, and then twice again for the MK. So as you go down in, in losses, you go up in volume and cost. Uh, quick introduction to our recyclone systems. Uh, they're not as widely applicable as our regular cyclones. They're excellent, but for very niche applic. Wait, sorry, but for very niche applications um, such as nanoparticles, uh, and they have been a life changing, life changing for those clients. But it does require a power source, and it's highly dependent on the size of the stream. It doesn't work for organic particles since it would cook them, and it also cannot be used in explosive or combustible environments. Um, I have never seen an instance where this system has been used for a pharmaceutical company, but it's always useful to keep in mind that there is a solution for nanoparticles. One of our clients, I remember, uh, came to us wanting to use something like this for an enzyme capture, 
And in terms of capture, it would be really good, but of course the enzymes couldn't sustain the electric current. Okay, this brings us to the end of the uh, technical part. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, applications that we have done in the past and, and distant and recent past. Uh, particle separation is required for the production and processing uh, of a wide variety of synthetic and natural APIs, as well as FPFs in the powder form. And this could be drying, mixing, grinding, micronization, or tablet pressing, for instance. Uh, today, we're mainly talking about spray drying. Uh, efficient recovery of powders after spray drying can be quite challenging, especially for expensive products and for products with a small, say, in the six micron or very small in the two micron particle size range, such as, for instance, inhalables, which we've done quite a bit of. Again, uh, aesthetic and easy cleanable cyclones have become mandatory in several drying processes. And so our cyclones provide this significant economical advantage in powder recovery. The choice of the current cyclone for a typical spray drying arrangement really depends on both the severity of the emissions of the first cyclones and the value of the powder that you're trying to catch. And so it goes that, uh, you know, for moderately to low value powder, we can just go for a regular first stage cyclone followed by a bag house and of course a HEPA filter. Uh, once the value of the powder goes up, then the logical option is a higher efficiency first stage cyclone, again, followed by a bag house, a scrubber, a HEPA filter. And for really valuable products, we advise on putting in a second uh, uh, stage cyclone for maximum first grade yield product collection and the powder coming in from the first and second cyclones. The problem here is you do have two collection points and the powder then needs to be mixed because they're gonna have different PSDs. So this is something that needs to be weighed in with the operationality of the situation. And then of course, at the end, you still need your police filter. So uh, Hovion, one of our earliest and best clients so far from the beginning, uh, they have purchased Cyclones and shared the excellent results they have with them. They have also in the past couple of years chose to replace those first few, few high efficiency models with newer and more efficient models as we have put them on the market. So they are now, they replaced their Nairo and um, Fisher Cloisterman cyclones with ours, and now they're replacing our cyclones with our better cyclones. Uh, the application now on screen is one of the very first cyclones we supplied. It's a cyclone for an API capture. Uh, their efficiency at the time was about 83%, so a lot of losses to the bag house. Our mid-range HR, the one we have been talking about, increased their efficiency to 96%. So this is a lot of, it's a lot more than 50%. And so it's easy to understand that the return on investment for this particular case is very quick. In fact, I can impart this. Um, I have heard from two different clients of ours that uh, sometimes in the first batch, the uh, investment is already um, paid for. Uh, for mankind, we were saying mankind uh, uh, work with a particularly fine powder. Uh, they have now purchased more than a dozen uh, of these units uh, with or without those catch pots, some ball valves for switching up the pots. And um, it's usually mostly the same cycle. Now they have upgraded, like I was saying, uh, from an MK to a KX that we are going to be delivering at the end of the year. Uh, Actavis, this is now a Teva plant. Um, this is a tablet press and not a spray dryer. And Actavis here just wanted to be able to account for losses. So they don't actually circle this back to their system after the tablet press, but they want it just account for it. And so they have those catch pots. They have one of these for each of their lines, I think 15 in total. Uh, they first purchased us two, two in different sizes and now they've equipped all of the lines with this. Uh, and it's it's just for, to, to be able to understand how much they're losing. This is uh, for Sanofi, it was a vaccine production. Uh, this is the smallest cyclone we've ever sold. Uh, it's 11 millimeters in diameter. You can see here it has pneumatic fittings instead of regular clamps. 
And conversely, for Ibsen in France, we have one here that works at very low temperature. See there, minus 85 degrees. Um, this is actually for um, chemical castration. And Merck, Merck have purchased two units from us already, I think. Uh, this was the, the very first one for some uh, solid dispersions, biologics and proteins. It's a lab application. Uh, Lonza first reached out to us through Dr. Shepard to look into a solution for small cohesive and static powders that needed separation. Uh, they've been doing a lot of investigation on inhalable chemotherapy. And so we used our MK, which is our highest efficiency cyclone on the market, as I was saying. And this one was actually pushed far with a big pressure drop as a consequence and a level, a level of noise, which is a little unusual for a cyclone operating within the average speed range. And some powders can accept these challenges and do well, but we must be careful where we apply this notion because there is always a possibility for reentrainment or resuspension. And this massively increases uh, with inlet speed. So increased velocity is a good thing in an inertial process, but there can be too much of a good thing. And after a certain point, we get turbulence and this wind trainment and performance goes down. So we're just going to go over a few details that can be introduced to enhance operation or maintenance of the equipment. Uh, cyclones can be delivered quite stripped or with a number of additional features. So, um, first of all, of course, retractable CIP nozzles. Um, the ones shown there are Tanko. The, these are the ones that we use more often. They're fully retractable, of course, because you cannot have anything inside the cyclone as it's operating. Uh, we use a lot of pneumatic impactors to ease discharge. I think most companies will recognize this model, make and model. This is an Ether PKL. Uh, we use a removable vortex finder or a lid, uh, and we have two different details for this. It's a, li a little bit of a lot to take in, those images there, but mainly the, the, the main difference is that we either put in a no ring there to stop powder from coming into the removable lid, and so gathering there, and it's waste powder, or some clients will say, no, I don't mind that the powder comes up to here, but then I want those mini clamps there to be able to wash it off. So these, these are two philosophies, two, two different approaches to the same problem. Um, there is little temperature loss inside of a cyclone. I, I need to say that because flow is quite active. Um, but it's more active at the top than at the bottom. At the bottom, it slows down and especially, and I'm sure most of you have this uh, experience. So discharge, it quiets down, it cools down. Uh, but though there is very uh, little temperature loss, uh, it's still worth considering heat tracing for some processes. Uh, we have done tracing with thermal fluid in the past. And uh, this picture actually shows a solution with self-regulated cabling in this instance. Sorry. The heating is not meant to work during operation, okay? Uh, the, the client can maintain a good temperature during operation. But after they run CIP, they need to reach, all surfaces need to reach 150 degrees for sterilization. And this is where they were having trouble uh, just with the air from the spray dryer because there are temperature losses across the, the line. And so they were... It took a few hours um, to get that temperature up at the end of the line. And of course, none of you want to waste, waste hours in sterilization and CIP. And so we put in uh, those um, this heat tracing just to get the, all the temperature back up quickly so they can turn around and get the next product in. Uh, this is just, um, this was just shipped out actually uh, after the summer. The play here, I can't get it. Um, it's a fairly large piece of equipment. In fact, it's the largest uh, surgical cyclone we have ever done. You can see the pneumatic impactors there at the bottom. There's two sets of retractable cleaning nozzles, those big ones there. Uh, the box for the electrical wiring on that on that side, a large flange for access to the inside of the cylinder. 
the little handles on top just to remove that vortex finder. The large flange is not meant to be used often, but it was still a requirement from the client. It can upset performance just a little bit, so we ask our clients to be judicious when asking for body flanges. Um, okay, so we are now at the end of the webinar, and I will be taking questions from the audience. So please, I don't know if you have already, put them in the chat. I'm going to check it now. Thank you for bearing with me this far. I do promise the end is near. I, I, Busy, everyone must be.